In this webinar series, we welcome private market leads and companies to learn about scope three emissions and why and how to engage with your value chain partners to reduce emissions. Uh, maybe just a few words on the ICI and the ICI scope three decarbonization group. If you can just maybe put a slide on the uh, on the ICI. Um, so the ICI is a global practitioner led community of private equity firms and investors that seek to better understand and manage the risks associated with climate change. We are to date uh, 236 members representing a combined 3 trillion asset under management. The ICI COP3 decarbonization group, which is a very long name, I know, is one of the many ICI groups made of a dozen of private equity firms, the PRIs and series. Our goal is to develop practical tools for our teams and our portfolio companies to reduce their scope three emissions. Over to you, Evan. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tom. I think that so. Um, I think Simon is going to do just a quick intro into uh, into Beringa. Yeah. So hi, everyone. So for those of you who don't know about Beringa, um, we are one of the world's sort of leading climate change and sustainability consultancies. We've got over two thousand professionals globally. Um, across and we work across ESG sustainable finance and uh, and climate change. We've got over 200 uh, climate professionals working in uh, the UK, Europe, Singapore, North America and, and Asia. We're a B Corp um, and so we're values driven. But it's, it's fair to say that our work is broader than just the uh, just, just climate change and consultancy. We're a full service management consultancy and we work across the full agenda driving growth reducing costs, helping clients to deliver reg regulatory compliance and also implementing innovative technology. And we're delighted to be partnering with ICI, ICI on this uh, scope three uh, scope three assessment uh, and, and these webinars. Next slide, please. So as Thomas said, this is the third of, of four webinars. Um, all the webinars um, are recorded and will be hosted on our website, and I think they will also be hosted on the PRI website. Um, and for those of you who've registered, we'll send out uh, the um, we'll send out the slides and the recording after the event today. So a brief agenda for today. Um, we'll go through very quickly because we've got a lot of content to to go through. So I'm going to hand over to Evan to start us off. Great, thanks. Thanks, Simon. So just going to do a quick recap on some of the material that we covered in the previous webinars uh, as a bit of context setting. So today we're talking about scope three emissions. Scope three emissions are all of the indirect emissions that come from the value chain of your companies as opposed to the operational emissions that set that you produce. So these are split up into upstream emissions, which are from production and downstream emissions which come from use of products and the disposal of products. Scope three emissions are set up into 15 different categories. And these categories, we more or less uh, material based on the kind of business that you have. Traditionally, we see most businesses, the majority of their scope three emissions come from category one, uh, purchase goods and services, and category 11, the use of products. Uh, but as you can see with some of the example sectors here, there are a couple of other ones that will fall into different areas, and that's why it's really important when you're looking at your scope three emissions to find the material sectors so that you're going after the emissions that are most relevant for your business. The next area that we covered in the in webinar two was about this, the GHG's approach to collecting data. Really important before you can start to set your targets that you go through and you actually have that data to, uh, uh, to measure. Uh, so the first thing you want to do when you're approaching your data strategy is about prioritization. This is about getting the most relevant data that's the most important for your business. Uh, so you'll want to do sort of high level assessments. These kind of questions can look at things like, where is the majority of your scope for emissions coming from? Where is your sort of spend and revenue, finding those uh, important areas, as well as looking at where you might have risks from your value chain and seeing where those emissions are coming from. After you've prioritized the, the data, you want to start thinking about 
how you select the most relevant data. This is for looking at the data quality, thinking about what sort of data is available, thinking about whether or not you'll be looking at primary or secondary data, uh, and the goals of the business. The fourth, uh, uh, the third area that you go that you look at is then once you sort of set, um, you've selected that data, you be, then begin to actually collect it and sort of fill any gaps that you find. So this is, this involves you in engaging with your tier one suppliers, collecting data from the value stream, and identifying where you might need secondary data. And then that finally leads to the fourth stage, which is all about improvement. Uh, as anyone who started to look at scope three emissions will find there's a lot of data quality, there's a lot of proxying. Um, it's really important to start the journey and it's much better to start with low quality data and then build that over time, uh, rather than thinking that you need to wait until the data is perfect. Because in the industry that we're all working in, the data is, is never going to be perfect. So it's better to get started sooner. So that was just a bit of context around the other webinars. We talked about that. What we now want to go into is once you've got that data, thinking about how you set a science-based target. So a lot of times people can uh, talk about the SBTI and science-based target. And um, we just thought it would be useful to point out exactly what a science-based target is because all SBTI targets are science-based, but not all science-based targets need to be SBTI targets. When we're talking about science-based targets, there are three really central things to consider about what makes a target science-based. This is a carbon budget, an emission scenario, and your allocation approach. Carbon budget is looking at how much carbon is able to be in the atmosphere in order to have a certain temperature outcome. So if the world wants to be 1.5 degrees, there will be a certain amount of carbon that can be, exist uh, and keep that temperature. If there's more, obviously the temperature gets higher and higher. And that's where your that's what a carbon budget is. So it's setting that so scientifically working at what how much carbon can be in the atmosphere. After you've worked after you've established that, they then look at what's called an emission scenario. The emission scenario looks at how that carbon budget is distributed over time. So if you were to say that the world can have in 100 years, they can have we can have an additional 100 tons of carbon in the atmosphere then you could say every year we'll have one ton of carbon, but that's not quite realistic for how the world will actually transition. So you look at how it's going to spread, what the rate of change is going to be, how different sectors will decarbonize, and all of those core considerations go into creating an emission scenario. Once an emission scenario has been established, you then start looking at how do you allocate that, uh, that carbon to an individual company based on sort of sector, geography, globally. So if you're then setting a target, you're using that allocation approach. So those three steps set what you can call a science-based target. Now, all of that sounds very, very complicated because it is a little bit complicated. Luckily, we've got the science-based target initiative. So the SBTI have come up, um, has three sort of core fact, core contri contributions to us working in, in sustainability, making setting science-based target much simpler and less intimidating and complex for the rest of us. So they've got three main things that they do. The first is setting standards. They set standards to say, what do you need to do to make a science-based target? So rather than thinking about all those complex emission scenarios and what you need to do to look at your carbon budget, they come up with a set of criteria, 28 requirements. And if you follow those requirements, you'll be able to set a science-based target. They also have 12 recommendations. So it's quite robust about what you need to do. And that vastly simplifies the process for setting a target. In addition to setting standards, they provide a lot of technical assurance. So all of that information, all that thinking, they have lots of scientific bodies and expert groups that are thinking about what, how different sectors will decarbonize and creating tools in order to help us set targets within these sectors. And then the final thing that they, they do, which is very important in setting them up for the gold standard, is having a validation process. So because they've got that big long document with 28 different criteria, what they can do is look at your target, evaluate it against those 28 criteria, and say, tick, tick, you've done everything you need to do, we can certify that you've followed the right steps that we've outlined, 
and therefore we can validate that your science that your target is science based. This is giving a lot more credibility to in, to, to to setting targets. So it's not just a company going away and saying we're going to reduce our emissions by 20%. It's following very spe specific guidelines and then having those guidelines that you've set it uh, that you've set the target appropriately. So that's really what the SBTI has done. It's grown very quickly. So we have over 5,000 companies have agreed to take part in the science-based target initiative. Nearly 3,000 targets have been set, which represents one third of global market capitalization. So all of this is a really great tool from the SBTI. Uh, and that's what we're going to use today to talk about scope three emissions. Scope three emissions have actually, so about 96% of companies who have submitted targets to the SBTI have looked at scope three emissions, which are quite complicated. That's really, that's what we want to discuss a little bit more today. Um, so thinking about the process that you go through in order to set a science-based target, um, the first thing that you look to do is um, is commit to setting a target. One of the things that we found is really important uh, when we've worked with companies who are starting this journey um, is to go through a high level sort of impact assessment and bring the business along the journey. So rather than just saying, yeah, we'll crack on, we'll just do it, it's doing a little bit of homework, doing a bit of an impact assessment and thinking about what setting a science-based target is going to mean for you as a business before you make that commitment. Once you make the commitment, you then have 24 months to actually develop your target. So this is where you bring in consultants or you might try and try, try to do this in-house and you apply those criteria. You're taking your um, carbon footprint, you're taking all of the rules and recommendations that the SBTI has given you and you're setting that target. Once you've done that, the board has signed it off, you're able to then submit the target to the SBTI. Uh, the SBTI has an online submission tool. So you, for, you register a time slot when you think you'll be submitting it and then they'll turn that around after a few months. They tell you when they'll be able to, to produce it for you. After you've submitted the target, the SBTI will come back to you with some with feedback. Uh, so if you've been approved, they'll tell you, great, you've been approved and you've got six months to tell everyone the good news that you've set a science-based target. Um, they also, if you've not met, met the criteria, they'll come back with detailed feedback about where you, um, where you need to improve or what you've done incorrectly that you can resubmit uh, and get that target approved. But once you've communicated it um, within sort of that, that six month period, you then go into disclosure. The SBTI doesn't currently have a process where you need to submit sort of your target every year. So you don't need to tell the SBTI how you're progressing against the target. Um, but what you are expected to do is disclose that information yourself. The SBTI recommends that you submit to CDP or you submit, uh, you, you um, publish your, your progress and sustainability reports or on your website. So you're publicly talking about how you're progressing on your science-based targets. And that's really important. And that's sort of, that's where the sort of accountability comes by this public disclosure, even though the SBTI is not necessarily actively monitoring whether or not you're achieving the target that you set. So going on to um, talking a little bit about scope three emissions, uh, I should say, sorry, um, if, if we didn't mention earlier, uh, we do have sort of, if, if you want to ask uh, questions as we go through, please, please do. Uh, we've got time at the end of the webinar to, to review your questions. I appreciate that I'm going quite quickly through some very complicated concepts. Uh, so certainly ask us questions and then we'll, we'll get to those at the end. Um, so the next thing we want to talk to you about are the three, the different kinds of targets that you set when you're joining the SBTI um, for, for specifically for scope three. So you have two types of targets that you can set, a near-term target and a long-term target. You don't necessarily need to set a long-term target when you start. You could just be setting sort of near-term targets. Um, when you're looking at whether or not you need to set a scope three target, not all companies who join the SBTI need to set scope three targets. Uh, you only need to set a scope three target if you have more than 500 employees and your scope three emissions represent more than 40% of your total emissions. So that scope three is 40% of scope one plus scope two plus scope three. Um, and in that case, so if you're, you need to set a scope three target, you then for your near term target, that needs to cover 67% of your total scope three emissions. When you're setting a near term target, 
uh, you you have to uh, near term target is a five to ten year target. So this is a really tactical target that you're looking to achieve in this in a small amount of time. Um, this is setting kind of, and then you might have your long term target, which is your more strategic direction. If you've made a commitment to net zero, this is the really tactical area that we're looking at here. There are four different ways that you can set a, a science based target uh, for scope three, uh, and you can also you can use any combination of these. So you don't just need to set one. You could cover different areas. You can use different types of targets as long as they add up to at least covering 67% of your total scope three emissions. The first one to talk about is absolute reduction. Uh, absolute reduction is one you might be familiar with. Um, the majority of companies who join the SBTI um, have to set a absolute reduction target for their scope one and two emissions. This is following the same sort of process uh, it's a very robust target. You're looking at real world, actual emission reduction. So it's very, very credible and probably seen by the market as the most credible type of target you can set. Now, one of the big differences between scope three and uh, targets and your scope one and two targets is that when you're setting a near term target, you can set a well below two degree target uh, for scope three. Uh, the SBTI for the last year has required all scope one targets to be 1.5 degrees aligned, but recognizing that scope three is much more difficult to achieve, you can set a, um, two, a well below two degree target for, um, for your scope three right now. Uh, so that's your absolute reduction. You then have uh, an option to follow a sector decarbonization target. Sector decarbonization target uh, is one that the SBTI has designed for specific sectors. This is most relevant for sort of if you're looking at sort of buildings, um, so leased assets and franchises, uh, also relevant for sort of upstream and downstream transportation or distribution. Um, one of the challenges that you have if you're looking at setting sort of an SDA scope three target, um, let's say that you're a, um, uh, a company that's a, a building company. Uh, if you're a building company, you might you'll be using a lot of steel. You might choose to set the set a, an SDA target for your scope three emissions using the SBTI's iron and steel pathway, which you can do. That follows the rules. Uh, but in the future, you might decide that actually we're going to start to move away from steel and we're going to start to use different materials. So sometimes using the SDA uh, can be a bit tricky for some of those other types of sectors uh, when you're looking at scope three emissions. The next area, uh, the next kind of option you have for setting a scope three target is physical or economic intensity targets. Uh, these are good, uh, good target type for uh, companies that are looking to grow. Um, so both of these cater more for growth than an absolute reduction target. Absolute reduction targets can make it more challenging to, to increase your production and grow whilst reducing your emissions. So these both kind of cater for business growth. The first um, around physical intensity, the so physical intensity is looking at the emissions per unit of output. So it might be the tons of CO2 per shoe that you produce um, if you make shoes. Um, one of the challenges around doing physical intensity is that it requires businesses to make sort of homogeneous products. So if you do make shoes, it's a lot easier to set a target. If you're a business that has lots of different kinds of output, um, that doesn't have a common metric, it can be very difficult to set a physical intensity target. But the benefit of it is that it, it really shows how you as a business are decarbonizing and shows how your growth and efficiency improvements um, are independent of your growth, are, are independent of sort of business growth. Um, the flip side of that is an economic intensity target. Uh, economic intensity looks at the emissions that you produce per, um, va um, per value added. Um, as, as a business. So you're looking at kind of your economic value that you're adding. When you're doing the, these kinds of uh, targets, uh, it's a very clear way to communicate your targets. Uh, it's very good to cater for business growth. But the challenge that we've seen a lot with economic intensity targets is that sometimes viewed as being slightly less credible. Um, and that's because you can have external factors that can influence your emissions target. So because you're looking at your economic intensity and your, uh, your revenue um, and your costs are key inputs into this calculation, you can see that 
uh, if uh, inflation or increases or decreases in commodity prices, all of those things can, those economic impacts can impact whether or not you're achieving your target. So it's not necessarily showing if you're causing real world decarbonization. Um, uh, and that's, but they are both very good targets to cater for growth. Um, the final, the final category is uh, an engagement target. Um, I'm not going to call a supplier and uh, customer engagement uh, a Ponzi scheme, but it's a little bit Ponzi scheme shaped. Uh, the idea of this is that you go out to your customers and your suppliers, and you then encourage them to join the SBTI. So you meet your SBTI target by getting them to join the SBTI. The idea is, of course, the more people that join the SBTI, the more people that are signing up to science-based targets, the more emissions will decrease. So the benefit of these types of targets is they require very little data. It's much easier for people sort of starting out on their journey of decarbonization. Uh, the challenge around it is that because you're not actually measuring uh, emissions, it makes it more difficult to be able to quantify the actual impact that you're having. It also means that the only lever you're able to pull is engagement. Other things that you do aren't going to impact uh, your supplier engagement target. Whereas with some of the other options, there are other things that you as a business could strategically decide to, um, to do. Those are your near-term targets. Um, then looking at your long-term targets. So if you're going to set a long-term net zero target, it uh, doesn't need to be a net zero target, but um, tr uh, traditionally they are. Uh, you need to cover 90% of your total scope three emissions. Um, it needs to be achieved by 2050 or sooner. But this is of course then different. So this is your strategic direction versus setting a five to 10 year target. Um, you've got the same methodologies, uh, except you're not able to use supplier engagement to set a long-term target. Um, you need to pick one of the other three options. And you can see here it switches where if you're setting a long-term target, you need to be back aligned with a 1.5 degree pathway. So if you're joining the SBTI, you're setting a 1.5 degree pathway for your scope one and two, your long-term scope three will then match that. Uh, but you generally have the option of setting a below two degree target, slightly less ambitious uh, target for your scope, um, for your near, term, your near term. Appreciate I've thrown quite a lot of information. Um, we are obviously happy to take some questions at the end, but all of this is obviously available on the SBTI's website. They're quite prescriptive about what they do. Um, and generally, of course, we're, we're happy to, to get in touch um, with because appreciate this was a lot of information to download in a quick amount of time. Um, but I will I'll pass to Simon to talk about some of the uh, best practices that we've seen. Yeah, thanks, Evan. So um, it's worth thinking about some of the some of the good practices um, that will set you up for success in setting your scope three targets. The first one is develop scope three inventories for your material sectors. Uh, identify your material sectors, identify the operations, the types of activities which are generating emissions and catalogue them, categorise them so you know what they are. So you've got this inventory of your material sectors and the material activities in those sectors which are generating your emissions. Second thing to think about is collect high quality data. Um, I think procurement and supply chain professionals are now getting quite used to um, engaging on this topic. So use your procurement team, your suppliers to ask them for their data, uh, for their you know, primary data, so that you've got good quality coming back, coming back through your supplier relationships, if through your procurement teams, um, that is gonna get you most quickly to uh, a reasonable scope three, um, scope three footprint. Thing about SBTI specifically is that offsets should not be counted as reductions towards meeting it. Um, so companies should account for the reductions resulting from the direct action within their operations or their value chains. So that might come as a surprise to some of you, but offsets are not included in the science-based target. And then estimate scope three emissions every two or three years if you can't do it every year uh, to check to see if there's been any significant movements. Uh, changes in uh, scope three emissions. There might be changes in in in, in scope, changes in uh, in sort of in sort of description. 
but it's worth doing that and monitoring what that looks like. Uh, once you've set these sort of schemes, uh, these schemes up, or you're reaching out to your supply chain, hopefully the information will start to flow inwards to you, so you can, so you will have information and, and increasingly good quality information over time. Uh, but where we're still in the waiting, you can wait for wait for better better data. So don't be don't be using patchy proxy data every year. It doesn't make much sense. Only keep going when the when the data is getting better. Sorry, onto the the next slide. Some things to uh, to avoid doing. Don't set a target to only collect data. Um, that's not a real world impactful target, um, not helpful, uh, it, it's not relevant. Um, targets that cover avoided emissions, um, uh, emissions reduced against a, a BAU baseline. Um, this is this is slightly controversial for renewable energy companies and SBTI are sort of thinking that through. There are other methods and other science-based targets which allow you to think about avoided emissions within a renewable energy context. Um, but for SBTI targets shouldn't have, shouldn't cover avoided emissions. Also don't set targets which have been very nearly achieved. They're not ambitious or stretching enough. And we know that there's a lot more to go for. Uh, don't set targets without a base year or a target year, which is reliant to the next point, which is don't set targets without context. So, for example, to reduce emissions by 5 million tonnes by 2030 is, is not a helpful or a transparent target because there's no context. So think about setting a target where you've got a percentage reduction with a base year and a target year, which is then much clearer for the reader, much clearer for the business to seek to achieve. So a couple of points there to, to think and reflect on, and uh, we can come back and address any of those in the questions if you've, if you've got any. Hand over to our case study. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here today and uh, have the opportunity to share our experience in terms of uh, climate journey and especially the scope free target setting. Um, I'm Manon Durbeck, I'm Sustainability and Climate Manager and working for the, the European-based uh, food company uh, named uh, Laberry Fine Foods. We are operating on several uh, value chains like uh, seafood, plant-based and uh, duck, duck products. Um, Laberry Fine Foods is part of the food industry, as you may understood, uh, which is responsible for approximately 25% of the global emissions. Uh, and all our stakeholders, um, including uh, our customers, our consumers, our employees, our shareholders, uh, and so on, have a very clear expectation on uh, on this topic. Um, that's why we have been working on a mitigation plan, um, meaning a, a strategy to to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to mitigate the effects of uh, of climate change. And uh, SBTI was from the beginning. A must have for us to bring uh, credibility to our approach and uh, our commitments. So to initiate this uh, climate journey, we have been uh, supported by an external uh, consulting firm, expert on uh, climate stakes, um, to carry out our first exhaustive carbon footprint on scope one, two and three for the world group, for the world activities all along the value chain uh, and to define our reduction targets. Uh, this trajectory is based on a reduction roadmap uh, built uh, collectively uh, with uh, all our internal uh, stakeholders and covering all the aspects of um, our activities. Next slide, please. So regarding um, our trajectory and the targets and the, their validation, uh, we have submitted our midterm targets, uh, so to uh, 2030. Uh, to the SBTI uh, last year, and um, uh, those targets have been uh, assessed and revised because the, the reduction uh, reached between the base year, uh, which is uh, 2019, and the submission year uh, was already uh, too important thanks to uh, first reduction actions um, implemented, uh, especially on our cooling systems. Uh, so we had to review our midterm targets for, for to, uh, scope one and two, and we switch from uh, a reduction uh, of 
46% to a reduction of 55% uh, um, for our scope one and two in absolute figures uh, by 2030, um, and a reduction uh, target uh, in intensity for scope three, for scope three of 22%. So the, the scope three reduction is the most uh, challenging part of our journey. Um, obviously, raw material procurement are accounting for, for the biggest part of our footprint, um, about 75% uh, of the global footprint of our activities. So that's all the indirect uh, emissions mainly coming from the raw material suppliers' uh, activities and operation. So it appeared uh, to be a very key for us to work with our suppliers um, that uh, will uh, support us in our journey, uh, being committed to the long term with clear targets defined and uh, concrete action in place uh, to reach those targets. So uh, climate stakes are taking an increasing part of uh, our uh, purchasing strategy and we are including all the all those uh, aspects in uh, in the way we are working um, in our business uh, partnership with uh, with our suppliers, because we won't be able to move forward and significantly uh, tackle the emissions in our supply chain without these collective commitments of our key suppliers. Um, and regarding this uh, this uh, scope three uh, targets, which is uh, an intensity a physical intensity target. Um, when we consider the, 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 the current context and the, the economic uh, environment, uh, which is so unpredictable and uh, that uh, can be, uh, that, um, it can be hardly um, robust and long term in the indicator nowadays with the volatility of the, the cost of the raw material, like uh, salmon for us, for example, but also the production cost and so on. So uh, that's why we, we decided to state um, physical intensity based on the amount of uh, products uh, produced. Um, it appeared uh, to be uh, more uh, appropriate to, uh, to move forward. Next slide, please. Regarding the, the practical aspects of uh, all this and the monitoring of uh, our approach, um, so we have put in place an internal uh, climate uh, community uh, with both an operational steering committee with the, the operational to, 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 to work on the operational management and monitoring of uh, the approach involving all the key operational roles uh, of the decarbonization action plan, like the procurement, supply chain, transport, uh, production sites and the energy management and so on, but also an awareness program with the target of having a, um, hundred percent of uh, the the group's uh, employees being trained uh, and um, and um, raised uh, to raise the awareness of all our employees on uh, on the climate stakes by the end of uh, 2025. Um, and regarding the the tracking of our progress, uh, we are updating. Um, our carbon footprint on a yearly basis. Uh, we are using a, a digital uh, monitoring tool that uh, helps us to collect the data, to handle it, and to car carry out all the calculation and monitor all the action plan and quantify the the, uh, the impacts of the action that we are implementing. And we also have, and regarding the governance of uh, all this, uh, we have a big support from the the executive committee of the group um, with a sustainability steering, steering committee with the board of the group every two months um, with a, a dedicated session on uh, climate that enable us to, to share the results, to share the action plan, to share and discuss all the challenges uh, and the next step and so on. So that was uh, the, the, the key information regarding uh, our journey. Very happy to answer the question uh, that you may have. Um, and uh, I will now want the I will now uh, hand over to Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Manon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so before we get started in the case study, maybe just give a bit of context on, on ADM Group. So uh, I'm the Managing Director for Group Operations, but also our Chief Sustainability Officer. Um, and that's an attempt from us to try and ensure we embed sustainability in our operations and supply chain. Um, a big part of the reason for that is that, you know, we're a marketing services firm who procure uh, physical marketing materials. So we we design, source, and deliver uh, lots of branded items that you'll see in everyday life. Especially if you if you go into a bar, if you go into a department store, to a beauty counter, anything physical is branded. That's the sort of thing that that we do. So we, as a business, 
we manufacture nothing ourselves. We don't have warehouses. We don't have, uh, you know, lorries or anything like that. Um, so 99.9% .9 of our emissions are scope three, which gives us a real challenge when it comes to setting science-based targets um, and, and reducing our emissions because there's very little in our own direct control. So we, we baselined um, using 2021 full year data uh, uh, in the second half of last year. Uh, we measured eight out of the 15 categories. You can actually see on the screen in front of you the uh, our actual emissions there. Um, and as you can see, purchase goods and services, category one, the scope for emissions was by far and away the largest. No surprise given the type of business that we are. Um, and that equals about 76% of, of our total emissions as a business purely comes from the products. Um, some of the other categories we measured because we could, as you can see, they've got very limited impact, um, but we did so as a, because we could. In terms of uh, setting targets in this case study, you know, I think there's three broad consideration areas, um, which we'll go through slide by slide. So the first one, kind of obviously, is the actual setting of the targets. Um, now, I think the first thing is understanding the different targets you can set, which is which you know has been discussed. We took a view as a business that that we felt we had to set um, absolute targets. So we felt that intensity by intensity targets could be a little misleading. You know, you could double your emissions as a business, but if your revenue or your uh, the, the physical uh, materials that you that causing those emissions is more than doubled, you can show a reduction by intensity, which I think, and, and we as a business think, is slightly misleading and is not really necessarily within the spirit of what the science-based target is trying to achieve and what the, the 1.5 degree pathway um, that the Paris Agreement is about, uh, again, uh, aligns with. And then in terms of supplier engagement, you know, we have, obviously, all of our emissions come through our supply chain. Uh, we operate with around a thousand suppliers globally uh, across um, uh, four continents. We just felt that supplier engagement is a bit of a cop out, if I'm being brutally honest. Um, you know, as being discussed, you're not measuring, but also you're going to need to have to engage your whole supply chain to achieve absolute or intensity targets. So it, it just feels a bit a bit of a cop out to only have an engagement target and then not one that actually relates to your emissions. So we felt that the the ethical and, and correct thing to do was set absolute targets, um, which which gives us a you know a, a big problem. Um, so, you know, the considerations that we had to take into account when when making that decision were that this will require a significant strategic change in our business. Um, so at an executive level, and I'd say some are probably more cognizant of this than others, you know, an absolute uh, emissions reduction target that we've set is going to require a, a complete change in our business proposition where we, we will need to pivot away from being a products first services second company to a services first and product second company. Um, and, and that's, a, you know, I'd, I'd really urge everyone when you get around to setting your targets to really think about what this will mean for your business strategically over the next 5, 10, 20 years, because it will have an impact, uh, even if you don't feel it for the next few years. Um, the other thing I flag is, you know, is, is, is have a think at the point you're setting the targets about what your carbon reduction strategies might include. You know, uh, don't feel that you need to have the answer. Um, if anyone tells you they have a full roadmap and know exactly how they're going to achieve their science-based target, uh, the truth is not in the vicinity. No one does. It is a journey, and I personally think, and you know, I think this is many of many of my colleagues in the sustainability sector. It is far better to start now than uh, have perfection become an enemy of making progress. So, you know, again, for us, that was that was one where we thought we have a few strategies. Let's get going. Um, and finally, consider what what clients and you know what com your customers and your competition is doing. Clearly, that's a, that's very relevant. Um, you know, you've got to think what sort of business do you want to be in the sector? Uh, where do you want to be in a few years? Where will your clients be in a few years? So, they were some key considerations considerations we took at, at the gate. If we go on to the next slide, um, the next stage, and I think you know you'll all experience this as you as you progress through, is getting executive buy-in. As I've said, you know, setting science-based targets can if you if you try and adhere to them, have significant impact on on your business strategically. Um, so there are a couple of key focus areas here to try and gain uh, the the our global board's buy-in here. The first one was access to markets and our growth agenda. So our clients are typically global CPGs um, who have their own sustainability targets. Many of them already signed up to the SBTI with science-based targets already set. And in our sector, you know the ability to support 
uh, our clients with their sustainability agendas has become table stakes to play. So if we weren't setting targets or we were setting targets that soften our, our clients, we have the risk that you know our access to the market will be limited and therefore our growth agenda severely impacted. And I think this is something, again, depending on the sort of business you are, but especially in the B2B world, increasingly you're going to find is, 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 you know, is going to be something you come up against. The second one was competition activity. We operate in a very consolidated sector. Um, volumes as well globally are, I think, going to decline due to one, the sustainability agenda uh, impacting physical market materials and two, uh, the rise of e-commerce and digital marketing so very much in a zero-sum game and we needed to be, you know we were very conscientious that we couldn't be less ambitious than our competition in such an environment because that in itself would again put huge commercial risk on our business's growth plans so you know both these points led quite quickly um to our board aligning that we that we needed to align with the 1.5 degree pathway as opposed to the well below two degrees pathway so the most ambitious um, and that we should set as ambitious absolute reduction targets as we can uh, and again these align with the more ambitious of our clients so we've set 50 percent reduction in our emissions across scope one two and three by 2030 and 90 percent by 2040 um hugely ambitious uh you know i am uh it's something i constantly think about how we're going to achieve those um we have i think some some good strategies in place for the near-term 2030 target if I'm being brutally honest, I think no one in the world will achieve their 2040 targets without systemic change to both the global energy mix um, and uh, government policy significantly uh, developing um, compared to what it is now. Uh, just as an aside in terms of pushback, because again, I think that's a concern for a lot of people in, in sustainability teams or, or procurement teams wherever sustainability is owned, there wasn't really. I think you know our, our board and CEO recognised very quickly that uh, for our sector, this was a must that we had to do. Um, and whilst challenging, we had no real other option. You know, I think, again, there's a recognition that it's far better to set targets that are ambitious and not reach them than not set targets. Um, so that's what we've done. I think also being slightly cynical, you'll find that at a shareholder level, whether we like it or not, those shareholders know they won't be there when the chicken come home to roost here and it, it is what it is so you're unlikely to get the pushback because they don't think they'll be held accountable anyway um the last thing i'd, I'd flag and this was this was a, you know i think quite a, a a key point for us in getting in getting the board buy-in was that we we proposed at the same time financial incentivization of our entire uh, business so all of our employees and we've actually implemented that uh, at the start of this year. So now 10% of everyone's discretionary bonus in our business is tied to four key uh, sustainability metrics, one of which, and the heavily, most heavily weighted, is emissions reduction. So that everyone now has a financial incentive to try and help our business achieve um, the emissions targets that we've set. So I definitely recommend that. And that's something we're seeing across, across some of our clients as well. So I think that's gonna be a, an industry trend that grows. And if you skip onto the last slide, um please the last one and this may be relevant to some not all of you is is wider considerations around um, uh, m a activity so the sbti and science the you know, sbti are trying to drive absolute reduction that's really what they want to achieve and the model makes total sense isolate entities it is challenging for companies that are looking to grow uh through m a activity or with rapid organic growth and this is something i'd really urge you to think about because it's something that we we really got under the skin of quite late in the process of baselining and then and then looking at our target setting and yeah you know, caused a little bit of a delay but it took a lot of a lot of uh, thinking analysis and, and discussion with the board about so yeah most obviously engage your m a teams ensure that sustainability and emissions criteria are built into your due diligence um i think it's really important to try and understand what your acquisition targets have done up to now to reduce emissions and what opportunities they think they exist very few companies include that in their dd um, but, uh, you know, it, it's going to be critical to whether or not you can achieve your uh, SBTs, your science based targets, if you're on an acquisition journey. Um, understand how and when you can baseline. Really important. Took me a while to get my head around. But basically, if you acquire a business that accounts for over 5 percent of your existing emissions, you can reset your baseline year. And you do so by bringing in an estimate of what their emissions were in that year, um, which is easier said than done. But but it does mean that if you have set absolute targets, it helps solve the problem of how you can possibly achieve your original uh, absolute targets by buying a business that you know equates to twenty or thirty percent of your of your own. Um, 
but nevertheless, you still have a problem that you need to achieve your percentage reduction target on the business you acquire. And I think this actually leads to a, to an interesting, I think, a potential flaw in the science based targets initiatives model. It's not one that I think should you know, should in any way, shape or form dissuade any, any of you from setting science based targets, but it's one to be aware of, certainly if you're a shareholder yourself, which is that if you acquire a highly sustainable business that's done loads of brilliant things already, you will acquire their emissions, but you're unlikely to acquire many opportunities, uh, low hanging fruit, so to speak, to reduce emissions in that business because they've done them. But your absolute target, your percentage target is going now to apply to their emissions. So in order to achieve the same percentage reduction that you set, uh, whether it's, you know, an annualized target, straight line target, whether you've got a, a curve target or whether you, you're just looking ahead to, to 2030 or 2040, you're going to need to pedal harder in your core business. Um, obviously, if the, if the emissions are negligible and so forth, it won't be a particular issue. But it does mean that on the flip side, if you require a business that's that's at high emissions, uh, and 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 therefore not you know not performing particularly well, you might uh, also acquire the opportunity to make significant inroads into their emissions, which can then almost pay for an underperformance in emissions reduction in your business. Because if you think about it, over the next um, over the next twenty years or so, there is going to become a market for acquiring opportunities to reduce emissions because of the targets that you'll have all set and and we've set. And I think that's quite a little bit perverse because what it's going to end up with is it could, might be, I might be wrong on this, but it could lead to an increase in valuation of companies that are bad for emissions and a decrease in valuation for companies that are good. Ideally, and, and, and you know, this is probably a bit of a unicorn, but ideally I think that you want to acquire businesses who were, who, who had started baseline, had started recording their data this in the, um, the buy or, or, or that point of your baseline year. So let's say you guys are choosing to set emissions, your baseline year might be 2022 data or 2023. If you acquire a business that has their data from that year and has since done some brilliant things, the bonus is you get to um, account their emissions reduction from that baseline year. So you almost acquire all the great things they've already done. So the, the unicorn is possibly to, to find a business that um, had data from uh, your baseline year that you can uh, go and, and re-baseline with and then has done brilliant things since that can help you with your overall target against that revised baseline number failing that someone that's done nothing but does have opportunities to reduce which is something you can drive out of of m a due diligence so yeah I, probably a lot to take in there may not have made a huge amount of sense but it's just something i would i would uh, really strongly uh, you know urge you to consider because it will have a significant impact on your um on your business and potentially the valuation of your company you know is going to be impacted by how you're performing against your science-based targets you know this is something that publicly reported through cdp and so forth so yeah i think it's it's just an aside that i really I strongly recommend everyone think about and then finally i think i've got one minute left um just some key lessons learned uh, things that you know would do differently if we could have our uh, time again um Obtain clarity on the methodology and accept a justification for rebaselining earlier. I think that would have saved me a bit of a, a headache. Um, discuss the impact of, uh, on SBTs, on MA activity with the board earlier. Again, critical to, for them to understand what I've just alluded to. Uh, you know, challenge your team and consultancy partners on the emissions reduction calculations. You know, we've worked with a, a, a really a, a great, really reputable global sustainability consultancy to help us baseline. Um, but yet, you know, we've had to go through 10 plus revisions of our data because there have been uh, inaccuracies in it. And what you don't want to find is you keep having to correct your baseline year because there was something wrong with it. So, you know, don't take the, the results at face value. Do get into the detail and challenge it and make sure your data that's being used to drive the calculations is correct. Um, and then, as I said, you know, at the start, you don't need to have a full roadmap where everything's mapped out. And you solve the world but try and identify some clear strategies to reduce emissions in your first one or two years to buy yourself time to tackle some of the, the more strategic and bigger challenges within your business. So that's everything from me.